Um, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Generation Analog. Um, we are at the third keynote of three, um, and it's my uh, extreme pleasure to introduce uh, B. Dave Walters to the group. Um, he is a storyteller, a proud scoundrel American, and best known as writer and co-creator of Electropunk Dungeons and Dragons, A Darkened Wish for IDW Comics, and also creator and DM of the Darkened Wish streaming show for Wizards of the Coast, DM of Idol Champions Presents, and of course, the Black Dice Society. And I'll say personally, um, as a Black man in this space, it's just awesome to see so much diversity in this conference today, and also to host um, a Black keynote. So, B. Dave, tell us something about diversity and inclusion in the content created space. We're taking notes. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, Full disclosure, I was just sharing uh, when we were behind the scenes that I thought this was in about another hour. Uh, and so I got up, I was rolling into the bathroom, about to shave, get some coffee. And I was like, I should probably tweet to promote this to make sure people come in. And then I noticed it was starting in about 10 minutes. So I uh, scrambled to get in here. I am ready, but I apologize if I look or sound a little flustered, but I am I would have felt a lot worse had I miscalculated, missed this. So yes, let's get to getting. Um, one other thing I'd like to say is I appreciate questions. Uh, I believe you all should have the option to interact in chat. Do you not? I believe you do. So please uh, give me any questions that you've got. I would love that. Uh, I have some things I wanna talk about, but as far as I'm concerned, we could spend the entire time um, talking about questions. So I, I would like this to be interactive. I would like this to be a conversation as much as me just sort of talking at you. So uh, questions, comments, please feel free to to interject them. One last thing, I'm gonna turn my air, my air conditioner off so I don't sound like I'm inside of a 747. All right, and, uh, and more than anything, I would just like to say, Thank you all for coming and attending Generation Analog. Uh, you are literally the heroes we need. Uh, this is a wonderful assemblage of people for a wonderful reason. And the conversations that this conference has fostered and the people that have taken it all in and going to carry it forth into the world are the, the real way that we will enact meaningful change in this world. Uh, it kind of has to happen on an individual level and from the ground up. So thank you for being a part of this and your participation. Um, one last thing, uh, I would like to say up front, shout out to my cis white male homies. Uh, I got nothing against cis white males. This always comes up at some point in these talks. So I just start off with it. Uh, I got friends who I would do anything for. I got friends that I would die for when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. Uh, we're talking about expansion. We're not talking about taking things away from some people. We're talking about making sure everyone has access to it. We're talking about making sure there is room at the table for everyone. Um, and, and I know sometimes that comes with, uh, it can come with a certain defensiveness from some people. It can even come as a certain amount of guilt from some people. I'm not interested in either of those things. So everything I'm about to share with you is about growth and collaboration, not about exclusion of anyone, including our dear, sweet, cisgendered white males. Now, why does diversity and inclusion matter? What are we even talking about? Because these are buzzwords that get thrown around quite a lot, especially recently. Um, you know, I think in, in, in light of the, the George Floyd protests, Black Lives Matter is people putting up their black square and you saw a huge uptick in advertising dollars spent to be in, you know, solidarity with people of color. What's that even about? Um, at the end of the day, fandom, fandom is about belonging you know, um, being into something, being a fan of tabletop games, being a fan of comic books or superheroes or even sports teams, you know, fantasy football is, is still, you know, TTRPGs for, for jocks, you know, um, that, that's what all of that is. It is about feeling like you're a part of something bigger than yourself, you know, 
I heard years ago, and it was proven to be true, um, that Doctor Who, for instance, is not about the doctor. Doctor Who is about the companion because the companion is you. You are taking that journey with him every week. You know, there's room on board the Enterprise for everyone. There's room inside the TARDIS for everyone. There's room in Helm's Deep for everyone. Although you maybe you might not want to go to Helm's Deep. Definitely more than Mordor. You ever see those uh, those uh, quizzes where it's like, what fantasy world would you want to uh, would you want to visit? And Westeros is on there. I'm like, why would anyone want to go to Westeros ever? Right. But the the fact is, everybody needs to feel like they can find themselves you know, in, in these places and see themselves reflected because, um, there's, uh, Jung put forward an idea, the idea, Carl Jung put forward an idea about, uh, the journey into individuation, you know, the fact that everyone in their life takes a certain trip in which you become who you're really meant to be. You really develop into yourself. You know, you inevitably heard of Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, Hero with a Thousand Faces, the idea that certain stories keep getting told across time and across cultures. And usually it essentially roughly is a kid who kind of comes from humble beginnings, may or may not be the chosen one or may have done it just on their own strength and their own merit. They go on a journey, they meet a mentor, they meet friends, they go somewhere and either do something or find something, and then they come home again changed. The hero's journey is all about that journey into individuation. Every culture in the world found a way to express metaphorically this idea of the journey that all humans must go through and roughly analogous to the steps that we all must go through. That's why it's so important that everyone see themselves reflected in these mediums to see themselves as both hero and villain as mentor and friend as every step along that, because it is the step that every single one of us must take. This is why if you ever hear me talk about the fact that that storytelling is sacred to me, storytelling is uh, a divine thing to me. And, and I take my vocation and the fact that I get to do this very seriously, because for me and for my money, storytelling is the thing that makes us human, right? Anything we do, some other animal does. And in the fullness of time, when we finally translate what crows and whales and dolphins are saying to each other, they and elephants, they might be telling stories too right now. But as far as we know, we're the only ones who can sit around the fireplace, talk about Hercules slaying the Nemean lion thousands of years ago, and take meaningful, actionable information out of that story that we can apply to our lives. It also can be something so simple as like, hey, you see those red berries over there? If you eat those red berries, you'll die. And say, oh, okay, no red berries. You know, the fact that we can transmit data like that is what has made us the dominant species on the planet. And whenever you have a certain group of people, that are excluded from that. To me, that is not just damaging on a social level. That is the same thing as damaging someone in their soul, right? So I hear all the time where people are like, well, what difference does it make if you change what color the orcs are? What difference does it make if there's black elves? Well, that's it. That's the reason because everyone needs to see themselves reflected in these things. So if you don't remember anything else that I said today, because I'm sure I'm going to ramble about a lot of stuff, just remember that. That's why this actually matters. On a practical level, uh, one of the reasons why diversity and inclusion is important is we've all got blind spots of things that we don't necessarily realize are offensive. Uh, and we're in a particular time right now that what is and isn't acceptable is evolving radically and evolving 
uh, on a, on a day to day basis. If you hear people that are railing uh, against cancel culture, there is no such thing as cancel culture. What there is is consequences culture. There are certain groups of people largely cisgendered white males, but not exclusively, who up until now have been able to say and to a certain extent do literally anything with zero recourse, you know? And, and if, if there was any pushback at all, well, I was just joking, was the only rationale that had to be given, and then it was all okay. So this idea that suddenly people are just too sensitive now, it's like, well, no, uh, nobody liked it all along. There was just nothing we could do, except now we can be like, hey, check this out. That's not cool. Don't say that. Don't talk to me like that. Don't refer to me like that. And that seems, uh, you know, if you've ever heard the, the, the saying that when you're accustomed to privilege, um, equality feels like oppression which just for the record, for all time here, let me give you a handy definition of white privilege. Cause I, I was just seeing, you know, as of the time of this recording, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, Ben Stiller was on Twitter talking about Hollywood as a strict meritocracy and there is no nepotism. And it's like, Ben Stiller, you're a cis white male that was born to two famous parents, bro. Like, Ben Stiller, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, a lot of times people that have profited from these systems uh, do not recognize that the system is in place. They do not recognize that it is working to their advantage. They don't see it because most systems in any capacity, when a system is working properly, you don't see it. You're not aware of the air conditioning until it's too loud or too cold or too hot. You don't think about the brakes on your car until you can't stop. Right. So a handy definition of white privilege is this. White privilege is always being given the benefit of the doubt, you know, that the the Brock Turners of the world, he's such a promising athlete, you know, the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, you know, oh, he's just young and confused. Mm, ask yourself, could a 17 year old black kid or a, a 17 year old Palestinian uh, or uh, even like a 17-year-old Jewish kid or anything other than what he was go on a killing spree with an assault rifle that he drove cross country to orchestrate and then hear what a promising young man he is and how confused he was. So it's always instantly being given the benefit of the doubt in the way that the rest of us don't get. You know, uh, I'm from the South. I'm from Arkansas. I largely stayed out of a lot of trouble and I didn't do a lot of the things that almost everybody does in high school because I didn't want to get buried under the jail. I literally never smoked weed once until it went legal here in California. And when it went legal here in California, I was 39. It wasn't that I had anything against it. It wasn't that I thought it was wrong or that I wasn't curious. I wasn't trying to get 40 years in prison for holding an ounce. Because that's how it goes down there. That's how it still goes down there um, in a way that the law in the system disproportionately affects people like me, which, as I mentioned before, chances are, if you're in this call, you're very clear on this. But maybe if you uh, have to explain this to someone who doesn't quite understand I alluded vaguely to Black Lives Matter before, which is still involved in the conversation of diversity. It is just it in its most extreme form. Diversity and inclusion is saying, hey, the opinions and perspectives of different people matter. Expanded. Maybe we shouldn't be murdered indiscriminately either. You know, like maybe maybe let's start over there. And then also I kind of have an opinion on, you know, Batman versus Superman. Right. But. This idea that some people don't matter is what we are fighting against. And this manifests in a lot of ways. This, this manifests as uh, women's voices, uh, as trans people's voices, as the LGBTQ community, any marginalized community, everyone should have a say. But like I was saying a second ago, you get blind spots that you're not aware of. 
um, where something is offensive or hurtful and you didn't know it. I can share an experience from my own past, which was uh, when the Me Too movement started. I was aware that you know women were subjected to some some hurtful behavior that, that everyone had been catcalled that everyone had been whistled at you know uh, or something like that. i was aware of that but when the story started coming out of just the horrific experiences that every woman has i really didn't know i truly didn't know and so i was like well if this is happening all around me and I don't see it, what well, I need to adjust my behavior. Because there, there was a statement that I heard that really stuck with me, that everyone knows a victim, nobody knows a rapist, you know? And I also heard another statement that, that, that the face of the rapist in the 21st century is not a person who is waiting in an alleyway with a ski mask on. It's the guy that wakes up the next morning and says to himself, she was into that, right? Yeah, she was into that. So knowing that I was missing something important, I realized that I needed to adjust my behavior. I needed to adjust my perspective. It wasn't about me being a bad person or willfully hurting people. I just didn't know. There's things like this at every walk of life that are hurtful and discriminatory, that unless someone points it out to you, you just don't know. And that is why it's important to have the voices and perspectives of lots of different people contributing to projects to make sure that these differing perspectives are all colored, covered. I said colored, huh? Paige and Dr. Freud, right? Are all covered. Does that make sense? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I can tell you, oh, hang on. Sorry, maybe I'm choking to death. It's not the Rona, I promise. I just got tested. Although I don't, I don't think it can be transmitted through a Zoom call. Uh, I had another experience just this very week where I'm working on a project that is taking in some submissions. And I was reading through the submissions. And there was one that I thought... Um, didn't quite work uh, mechanically. I felt like it was kind of missing something. Um, so it was a pass, but I was like, you know, because, because of X, Y, and Z. And I don't want to give too many details because you might be able to extract which of the things I work on that it might have been a part of. What, what it was wasn't important, but it was a pass because I was like, oh, it's missing this and this. <laughs> Some of my female colleagues that were working on this exact same thing were like, this is very hurtful and sexist and uh, there's a twist in it, but I would have bailed out long before the twist got there. And once they pointed it out to me, I was like, well, yeah, I guess it is. You know, I guess it is. I thought the story as presented was harmless, but when they were like, you do know that this, this, and this are messed up. Right. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess it is. Hey man, that happened to me this week. And I actively work on this stuff and try, you know, so you still have to be open and receptive. And more than anything, remember something important, especially now in this time where people are constantly being accused of being too sensitive. You don't get to tell someone else whether or not they're offended. You know, you don't get to do that. If someone says this course of action harmed me then you have to operate from the position that what they are saying is true and what they are saying is valid and then proceed. You know, uh, maybe you adjust, maybe you don't, maybe this is a hill that you want to die on that may or may not make you a jerk because uh, I definitely get people coming in me all the time, especially with my platform that are, you know, you can't say that or you can't use those words. And I'm like, mm, actually I can because blah, you know, have a seat. Right. Uh, like a thing that comes up all the time uh, is every once in a while, I'll mention having a spirit animal and it never fails that on occasion, uh, someone who is not a Native American will try and get up in arms and be like, you can't say that. And I'm like, well, two things, two things. One, uh, my great grandmother was half Choctaw, half Chickasaw. So I am Native American. So, yes, I can. Two, 
That's not a thing. Spirit animals is not a thing. No real Native American belief system. And they were diverse. Native Americans were not a monolith. There were many nations with many cultures, many religious systems. The idea that you've just got a spirit animal isn't really a thing, you know? Now, if you're portraying this in the context of I am the red man, how? Yeah, that's bad. But if you're just talking and passing, it's like this speaks to me on my soul level. That's not hurting anybody. Uh, and that is a, a, a place that I don't back down from. Now, if I were approached by real Native Americans, they were like, hey, bro, actually, may maybe don't. Maybe don't. I probably wouldn't anymore. But as far as I can see, as far as my experiences, that's not a thing. That's a thing I don't back down from. So you may have things you don't back down from. It is not that. You can never step on anyone's toes ever, you know, because the Bible said uh, you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, and I spit you out, you know. So you're an individual. You're a person. You might have certain stances that not everybody is going to agree with. Dare I say you will always have stances that not everyone will agree with. Not everybody can agree that the earth is flat, you know, or round right now, because if the earth is round, it is not flat. You know, that that masks don't help COVID, you know, like we're 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 in a crazy topsy turvy world here. What I'm saying is to the best of your ability. Be sensitive to the fact that your words and your actions are affecting those around you. And I'll tell you another thing that you have to be aware of. When. You're in a position. If 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 you. Let's say you tell an off color joke in the presence of some people like you tell a very sexist joke uh, in the presence of women or you tell a kind of risque uh, joke that, you know, maybe you're repeating what you heard Dave Chappelle say and you're not Dave Chappelle around a lot of black people. They might say ah, ha, 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 at the time, but inside now they know they can't trust you. Now they know, oh, you're not one I can lean on. And now I need to be wary of you, you know, and you might never know that. So they'll also be vigilant about such things where if, if you're like, well, they laughed, they didn't seem offended. Mm, yeah, but now you're on the list. Now you're on the list. <laughs> yeah. So again, be mindful, be vigilant. And I will just say one last thing before I go on to the to the next point. The Internet is the closest thing we have to worldwide telepathy. And honestly, I had this for later in my talk, but this this is a, a good time to bring it up. And, you know, it's interesting to see what we've done with it. And you see a lot of very hateful and horrific things being thrown around all the time as a person of color on the Internet. I would know back in the geek and sundry days, I would know that we were on the front page by how quickly I got told to go back to Africa, right? Which would always elicit, shall we say, a volatile response from me. But just as a general rule that I try and share with people, if you wouldn't say something to someone's face, don't say it on the internet, you know? If you are about to make a statement, maybe to someone's face, and you give it this one to make sure who's around before you say it, maybe don't say it. Maybe don't, <laughs> you know, maybe keep that one in your heart box. Maybe it doesn't need expressing, you know, because again, and I will continue to come back to this point, the whole concept of diversity and inclusion is about making a safe place for everyone to participate, to be able to craft a superior meal because you will have access to different chefs and different ingredients. And then that is how you make progress, how we make progress as a culture, how we make progress as a civilization. Now, although I will tell you how it is that I got started in this space, because it still goes back to the geek and sundry times, which was when we were still doing Ask Your Black Geek Friend. This would have been uh, still late 2017, I think, maybe early 2018. Um, the Tomb of Annihilation 
came out for Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition, where they went back to Chult, which Chult is D&D's quasi Africa. I mean, it's kind of Africa slash the Philippines slash anywhere with a jungle, but it, it, it's kind of D&D's Africa. And, you know, 40 years ago when it came out, it was mad racist. I mean, it was mad racist. You know, the, the cannibal pygmies, people with the bones through their noses, like all of it. And I grade on a curve for things in the past. That some things are a product of their time. I'm not necessarily easily offended from something that is problematic now that wasn't problematic then. It's like, let's just learn and adjust. Let's just try and do better, right? That's all. Uh, because 100% of things have some problematic elements that were products of their time. So Schultz comes back out, excuse me, and it was instead of being massively racist with, you know, pygmy cannibals and stuff, it was this just lazy post-colonial take on the region that essentially the the foreign occupying force had left and the black people in D&D were just kind of living in that shadow and kind of tried to to you know took up some of the trappings of their culture and were trying to make it the best that they can they weren't slaves anymore but they were still a shattered people and I was like, yo, come on. This is a fantasy world. You could have said the black people were on the moon. You could have made fantasy Wakanda. You could have done literally anything. And what you did was a diet racist quasi parody of what actually happened in real life. And the thing that was very abundantly clear to me and the thing that I was very public about was it was obvious that this was an issue of tone deafness and not malice. It was tone deafness and not malice. It was clear that no one who looked like me had been a part of this project. No one who looked like me had even read it. And when I started being very public about this, Watsi was like, you know, you're right, and we're sorry, and we'll do better. And they have, you know, shout out to Greg Tito. Greg Tito reached out to me and brought me in to uh, be on Dragon Talk, and I've had the chance to work with Watsi on some future projects. They've brought in a lot of different kinds of people for sensitivity reads. They've hired different kinds of content creators. Uh, Watsi's Wizards of the Coast, for those of you that don't know, they make Dungeons and Dragons who aren't fluent in geek. Um, and they've done the best they can to improve. Sometimes there's still missteps. There's always going to be missteps, but they're trying to improve, which is all you can ask. You know, turning a 50 year behemoth is not easy. You know, that's why the, you've had the change of the portrayal of the Vistani in Curse of Strahd, which are, you know, vaguely Roma, uh, Romani people. Uh, you've had the changes now to the Drow, which, of course, are near and dear to my heart, which if you saw when that announcement came out earlier this year, when I got to talk with Bob Salvatore about it. Because the thing that you will always hear me say, and I've been saying since then, and I will be saying 20, 30 years from now, any correlation between race and morality is problematic any if the orcs are evil because they're orcs that's bad because nine times out of ten the evil races all tend to be dark-skinned tend to be swarthy tend to be savages and all these other dog racist dog whistles from the past and all of the good races tend to be fair, pale skin, blonde hair, right? The drow that were the dark elves, they're just midnight black skin, were the evil elves, right? And it's like, mm, why do black elves got to be evil? You know, don't get me wrong. I represent for the drow, but I knew all along that I'm like, yeah, but that's not cool, though. The black elves are the evil elves. Like, come on. Because one thing you will find in my storytelling, because I do a lot of streaming and writing and things like that, is an idea that I always come back to is intelligent creatures should behave intelligently. If you've got a thing with free will, then it should be able to decide for itself what it is. As such, you should have a spectrum of things that maybe are uh, good, maybe are evil, maybe are um, 
uh, somewhere in between, you know, you should be able to have atheist drow. Although atheist D and D characters are always funny to me. Cause I'm like, the gods are like around, like we could go find law. Like she's over there, you know, but it is a possibility that it exists because the reason why this is so important and you might think it's harmless because it's literally fantasy is it transcends itself into real life stereotyping and that can be very harmful anytime that you're like of course the orcs are like this it's a very slippery slope to be like of course the koreans are like this you know, of course, the Russians are like this, you know, that's why it is important, even in fiction and fantasy, to create the world that we're trying to see, because writers actually create the world. It is no coincidence that the little boys and girls that grew up reading H.G. Wells talking about going to the moon put astronauts on the moon. It's no coincidence that the kids that grew up watching Star Trek The Next Generation made handheld data readers, made replicators, made holodex 3D printers in, in VR, right? Because those seeds were planted in their minds from the beginning that this is possible, that this is possible, and therefore it came into existence, you know? I truly believe part of the reason why we're seeing in the world this geek renaissance and this transition into a more egalitarian world is largely a lot of it is from from the MCU all the way back to Iron Man. We we owe John Favre a tremendous debt because now these movies are being made by people that grew up with these characters and love them and take them seriously. Before now, it was all cliche and goofy because it was kid stuff. But no, it was like people really loved these things. And when they make movies in content that is objectively good, you're like, oh, it's OK for me to admit that I love Iron Man. It's OK for me to admit that I love Spider-Man. Oh, OK. Oh, so it's, it's okay to admit that I love comic books. What about video games? And then suddenly this stigma of being into things, of playing D&D. &D, and I grew up during the satanic panic, you know, when they, these games were not just nerdy, they were evil. You know, like I went through the greatest stigma that could be applied to it. And that is why we're seeing this pass because it's just okay to be into stuff. It's okay to be a part of a fandom now, which that is uh, all very important. So knowing that we're seeing this renaissance and this influx of things, um, in, in, in influx is somewhat of a misnomer to tell you the truth. Yes, new people are getting into stuff, but it's important to note the different kinds of people were a part of these fandoms all along. You know, uh, women have been the first science fiction novel. Frankenstein was written by a woman. You know, uh, pe people have been reading comic books from the very beginning. You know, but people have been playing all kinds of people have been playing video games from the very beginning. It was often portrayed as a cis white male pastime. And don't get me wrong, there's still a very dominant presence of, by that demographic, but the rest of us were always there. We've been there from the very beginning. Now you're just finding out <laughs> that we've been there from the very beginning. But knowing this, knowing that we're having this time of transition, I think we all do know that there is a wide amount of toxicity in gatekeeping in these spaces that is the antithesis of diversity and inclusion. And I want to speak to you at least briefly about why it is that that happens. And a lot of us came into these spaces in the geek community as outsiders, right? Uh, we were not necessarily the cool kids, the athletes, the prom queens, you know, not necessarily. And being, you know, being in the comics community, being in gaming, especially if you establish any sort of reputation for yourself, a lot of times is the first time people got to feel like absolute rock stars, you know, where your name meant something and you had a following and people looked up to you for something in and, and fame and, and even infamy, are, you know, are are 
intoxicating when you don't have it, you know, when you've never had it before. And our community is full of badges figuratively and sometimes literally of epic status symbols. And when you can't show it necessarily physically, you can show it from the time invested, you know, from your achieves that you've got, from your rankings on the scoreboard, you know. Uh, these are things that you can show externally to to demonstrate your own prowess there. And, and everyone craves a sense of belonging and, and a sense of community. And for a lot of times, the outcast, this is where they went. The people that didn't feel like the cool kids. It was a, it was a digital Mordor where being fair was less important than your strength and skill an accomplishment. This was why when MMOs first showed up, why it was so immersive and addictive, because to, to a certain extent, you know, we got this in D&D, but with things like World of Warcraft, you could see it and your character was who you chose to be. They look like you wanted them to look, they could do what you wanted them to do, and they could go out and fight and they could win. And the world doesn't give us a lot of opportunities to fight and win, you know? And so, you know, that that is um, uh, intoxicating. And then you get I, I, I'm not wholly unsympathetic to the, the, the sense of outrage uh, that some of these people felt when the same people that they were trying to escape, the same cool kids that they were trying to escape suddenly turn up in these spaces and start to invade your your utopia you know the people that you'd convinced don't matter start showing up the prom queen arrives and she's better at your game than you are you know the the quarterback of the football team shows up and he's got a better comic collection than you do and that's when the gatekeeping starts right because how dare these people know so much about comics how dare these people be so good at overwatch and that's why you get this knee-jerk reaction that the pretty girl can't actually be a competent gamer she can't because she's got everything else and this is the one thing i got so she can't have this too and that's the gatekeep that's where the toxicity starts you know how can these actors you know show up and claim to love the same things that the geeks do Surely they must just be posers doing it for a paycheck. Surely they must be a bunch of casuals that can't tell a Kirby from a Ditko, Martha Wayne from Martha Kent, right? But that's that that gatekeeping misses the point. You know, these communities are built on love, you know, because I got friends who bring a radically different interpretation of Batman in his motivation that this community is enriched. Just as an aside, Batman is the single most compelling superhero because heroism is a measure of sacrifice. The spectrum of good to evil is a spectrum of selflessness to selfishness. Evil is synonymous with selfishness, and nobody gives up more than Bruce Wayne. It's not his fault. His parents died. He had nothing to do with it. He could give his money and in, in, in hire a, a private army to protect Gotham. That is true. But he goes out and he puts his mind and his body on his will on the line night after night to help his fellow human beings. No powers, nothing. Just grit. That's why Batman is the most compelling superhero. I will not be taking any comments or questions on that at this time. <laughs> Obviously, though, some people see it differently. And that's OK. Let me tell you one other thing that's going to kind of mess up your day. Understanding that good to evil is a spectrum of selflessness to selfishness. When you look at the world we're in right now and the fact that some people are so utterly unwilling to do the bare minimum to preserve lives of their fellow human beings, that is fundamentally selfish. We're seeing monumental, unprecedented levels of selfishness. And if selfishness is synonymous with evil, something to think about, something to, something to ponder when you're looking up at, at, the, at the ceiling tonight. Also, one thing I didn't say yet, my DMs are open on Twitter. I am going to read some questions here in a few minutes. Hopefully I've got some. I haven't even checked. But if I don't get to something that you want to ask, something you want to talk about, 
feel free to DM me at B Dave Walters. Uh, don't come at me with anything silly. I will roast you. Uh, but <laughs> otherwise, if you want to talk, hit me up. If you want to even just add me publicly. We talk about it in front of everybody. My, my, my doors are always open. But like I said, DMs are open because I know sometimes people want to ask sensitive stuff. Um, and I will not laugh at you for a real genuine question. You'd be surprised how many people try and start smoke with me in the DMs. And I'm like, mm, nah, I got time for you. <laughs> um, but you know, because shows like Critical Role have people who have high level acting talent with genuine lifelong enthusiasm for the subject matter is what makes us tune in to watch. You know, the because Ryan Reynolds loves Deadpool so much, you can tell. Because James Gunn loves the Suicide Squad so much, you can tell, you know. So uh, in conclusion of this point, at least, yeah, a hater's going to hate. But more than that, I'd remind you that when you use your candle to light someone else's candle, you haven't lost anything. You've gained a second candle. You should welcome the opportunity to have someone come into community and love the thing you love. And if they're like, you know, don't be like, oh, you haven't seen, you know, uh, all all you know, 10 seasons of Fate Stay Night, you filthy casual. No, everybody has to start somewhere. Don't give people a hard time for what they haven't seen. Instead, be excited that now they're going to take a journey where they get to discover the same love that you feel. You know, welcome them, help them get started. Because, and if you need a selfish motivation, the more people that consume the thing you love, the more likely it is that more of that thing is going to get made. So either way, yes, as a human and as an altruist, you should be happy that your fellow human beings are happy. Or just if your favorite thing sells more copies, you're going to get more of your favorite thing. Either one of those trying to keep people out of it doesn't really make much sense. So like I said, help them explore and enjoy the journeys that you've enjoyed. Like I said, at the top, there's room inside the TARDIS and the Millennium Falcon at Avengers Manor at the gaming table for everybody. And if you feel like someone can't love the thing you love because of their job or how they look or of their age, maybe it's not them. Maybe it's you. So uh, I do have one other thing to talk about, but I am going to detour and look at some questions here. I see a lot. Oh, whoa, a lot of comments going by. I'm like, have we had any? And it's like 99 notifications. All right, let's go all the way, way back to the top here. Let's see. Uh, comments. You know what? Uh, I realized I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball here because you guys have been way more talkative than I thought. If you have a question, if you've even already submitted it, write it for me again here in the chat, but put a capital question in front of it. The word question, all in caps, and post your question here because uh, I'm going to see all this. And also, y'all, I'm hearing people say you couldn't hear my AC. That's cool. I'm going to turn it back on because I don't have to boil in here if it's not bothering. So. Dave, you've okay. got you've got uh, qu questions in the Q and A. We've been tra channeling them over there, so you don't have to parse that massive chat. Uh, uh, so, where if, where are they? Where can I find if, them? If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should have it. Should be hey. a little red six, and then that'll be all, all nice and organized for you. Uh, let me see. Okay, we're we're we're, we're getting into high technology here because what you guys don't know is I have a two machine set. Okay, so here's how this worked, y'all. I have a two machine setup where I'm, I'm looking at you over here, but most of this is running over there. So my questions got pumped over there. So when you see me turning my head, this is because I'm gonna read them, but let's do it. Thank you. First of all, thank you, by the way. Um, which fantasy world would you like to go to? Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, I would go to Star Wars. I'd go to Star Wars because in my mind and for my money, um, so, by the way, belay that reposting the question. Uh, the, the good people at Generation Analog have already been on top of this. Thank you. Um, for my money, the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek, and this is what I don't think J.J. Abrams understood and muddied it up, is Star Trek is a fundamentally good world. Uh, things are going great. They're happy to be out exploring the galaxy. The Federation has solved most of humanity's problems. Uh, things go wrong. They fix it, and then they keep rolling and having a good time, right? 
uh, Star Wars is a fundamentally scummy world where evil is always on the ascent. Good is on its heels. And even if you can win in the short term, it is only temporary because the tidal wave of the dark side is coming. Um, but that's the world I would want to go to. Uh, I absolutely would become a Jedi. Um, and if that didn't work out as a proud Sith American, I'd be happy to to carry the banner. Uh, but yeah, that definitely is the, the world that I would want to go and get lost in. Um, Room in the table came up at an earlier presentation. It was postulated that the table itself, RPG culture and game rules may preclude making room if the table itself is the product of I just didn't know. How do we change the table? Quite frankly, I'd say play a different game then. You know, um, a lot of good work is being done uh, in the accessibility space. Uh, you know, my, my good friend, Jen Kretschmer, uh, does the disability and accessibility and tabletop guidebook um, in making some of these things more accessible. Uh, but if you really can't get your head around it, play a different game. There's lots of different games. That's why we're doing Into the Motherlands right now, which is our RPG that we just crowdfunded for. Um, we wanted to create a... Um, black and poc perspective into the sci-fi genre um that would not just be open to people like us but help other people not like us understand our vision of things we did it on purpose you know we couldn't find what we wanted so we made it you know uh, how does a small scale creative take on a more inclusive workflow when you're a solo actor, or a two person team? How do you incorporate more diverse perspectives into your work? Thank you, Evan. This is oh, hang on, choking to death again. Uh, this was something else that I wanted to say, and I hadn't got to hit this note yet. All things being equal, all things being equal, when you look around the room and everyone looks the same, that's not good, you know even within the motherlands that we outright and ostensibly wanted all people of color. We made a point that we've got uh, Latinos and Latinx people of various different persuasions. Uh, we've got um, even uh, Persian Americans, uh, Palestinians, just different kinds of people contributing to it. You know, if even if you're a one person or a two person uh, and I've been a solopreneur, solopreneur for, for a lot of years. When you do need someone, try and support a difference that is different than yours. Try and support a black owned business. Try and, and tap an Asian editor. Uh, try and, you know, if, if you've got an, an LGBTQ artist who style fits yours. Now, one thing I'm against, I am against just the diversity bingo of just I must hire an Asian person because I need to check that off the list. No, no. Hire the most qualified person to do the thing you need done. But as you're looking at the qualif at the at the applicants, if you're looking at the people who who are all in contention and you can sway that towards a minority or underrepresented person, do that. I would question if you get to the end of your project and everyone who is the most qualified are all cisgendered white males, maybe your criteria is off. But if you follow that simple guideline, um, it, it should get you where you're trying to go. You know, by no means am I saying you have to get people who aren't qualified to do the job. There's just all kinds of different people that are qualified to do the job. Um, oh, oh, they're scrolling up. There we go. Uh, what do you think is the role of story and raising awareness and how might that connect the game narratives? I think a story is, as I, and I covered this, but during the talk, I think story is the root of these things. You know, I think black Panther did wonders uh, for society of just portraying a civilization of proud, strong, intelligent black people. And I will tell you something that Stan Lee and, and Jack Kirby never get enough credit for. And I will always be, and I have to be careful. I can't talk about it too much. I start getting emotional. I really do. That when they created T'Challa in the midst of the civil rights struggle, they didn't just make him a good man. They made him the best man. Uh, they didn't just make Wakanda a good place. They made Wakanda the best place. I really do get emotional about it. <laughs> in, 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 in stuff, hang on, wait, sorry. I'm a G, I'm a G. Yeah, don't, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Um, and that's important, you know, that's important, uh, giving people, uh, examples to 
both look up to, to hearken unto and aspire away from, that's important. That's how story leads that charge. Hang on. I got to drink something now. Recover myself here. Uh, yeah, Sarah, but basically story has the most important place in leading this charge. Um, when you say that the world is becoming more egalitarian, are you talking about the world about selected nations and so much of the world, whoops, one could argue that the social trend is moving strongly towards an ever increasing hurdle of monolithic structures rather than embracing diversity. You know, yeah, there is a, a hard shift towards autocracy and strongmen in a lot of places in the world. And it's weird. Um, but I'm with Martin Luther King on this, that the arc of history bends towards justice. Um, you can't stop it in, in um, this is far more than I can go into in the time that we got, but I do believe that human beings are, are innately good. Some of us are wired wrong. Some of us are bad, but most of us are good. And I pointed examples like disasters. You know, someone can run off the road and their car burst into flames and strangers will stop and literally run into a burning vehicle to save someone during natural disasters. When buildings collapse and things like that, people stop and rush to the aid of their fellow human beings because that's what we do. We're pack animals, you know? Um, the light that uh, is shown from some of these communities, it is inevitable it will reach those other places. I mean, if, and if you look at all the horrific autocratic regimes over time, they fall. You know, the Soviet Union fell, Nazi Germany fell, like they will always fall. It is inevitable uh, that we will all reach this place together. Or, of course, abject extinction is a possibility, too. Um, while I agree partially with inviting people in these spaces, my main is issue is when they come in your spaces and commercialize to monetize money grabs and make the material crummy, how do you invite people in without ruining the original content? Uh, well, you know, vote with your wallet. You know, vote with your wallet. I, 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 I'm always very wary of things about, you know, ruining the original content because maybe the original content wasn't as great as you thought. See my example about Chult. There's a lot of 50, 60 year old dudes that think the first Chult was fine. It wasn't. But the simple answer is vote with your wallet. If you think somebody's coming in just for a money grab, don't give them your money. If someone else is creating something that is more in keeping and in alignment with the thing that you want, support that. This is why things like Kickstarter and crowdfunding are so important. And also, don't be overly precious about this. Again, with Black Panther, before it came out, there was a movement that really didn't take off where uh, black people were supposed to boycott Black Panther because they didn't really film it in Africa. And I was like, no, no, no. That is not the lesson Marvel and Disney will take from this if this movie fails. They will not take, we should have made it blacker. They will take from this, a black superhero won't work. Do not do this. Obviously you saw what happened with Black Panther. Um, and I think sometimes we fall victim to these purity tests. I see it a lot where people try and come after me and my work, which you might fine, doesn't really work on me, where if it's not this monolithic ideal of, of uh, you know, uh, social um, egalitarianism and wonder as agreed upon by whom, you should boycott it. But that's not the answer. When you find somebody that is even moving in the right direction, that they're even trying to create in the direction you want to see art go, support those people because that's how you get more of it. Obstinance does not work. Refusing to be like, well, we won't support this until it's this way, then it's just never gonna happen. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Sorry. Um, whoo, so many questions. Sorry, I didn't realize there were so many or I started earlier. Uh, question about the world building and representation of groups inspired by oppressed people, empowerment versus fidelity to their suffering in the real world. It's just that I encountered some critique of Wakanda like representation of an African nation because it obscured their struggle. Life's hard enough, man. Life's hard enough. I, I mean, it's fiction. You know, it's, it's easy to know how messed up the whole world is. People want an escape people deserve an escape not every single thing has to be so woke as to be an absolute mirror of reality i don't want that i have reality i don't need to struggle and have torture porn things can be idyllic 
You know, that's uh, it. And I, I would hope that, you know, people take a Wakanda and maybe that causes them to now want to give money to real life causes in the real life advancement of people, especially because Ryan Coogler made it quite clear that the problem with Wakanda is they weren't helping black people that didn't have what they have, a.k.a. real black people don't have this. Maybe you should help. It was all in there the whole time. Uh, what's my opinion on the drought? Should they be thrown out or reclaimed? They're going in the right direction. And I, I've talked to Bob Salvatore. He, his head's on right about it. Yeah. Um, does oops does play another game feed into D and D's gatekeeper argument against change? If you want these changes, you should play another game. No, I mean I'm myself making these changes. You know, um, I'm I'm facilitating it real time, all the time. I'm just saying not everything is going to be your jam and that's okay. Uh, you know, shadow run is not my jam. I'm not against shadow run. I could spend my life trying to repurpose it to a version of it that I enjoy, or I could just do something else, man. It's okay. You know, uh, Tanya to pass. Shout out to Tanya to pass. All of you should be following Tanya to pass cypher of tear on Twitter. She is a brilliant, fantastic woman and doing great work in this space. Um, in an ideal world, how far do you want the motherlands to go in terms of world building and making it a property out of it a la uh, CR? I mean, hey, I'd love to go all the way up. Uh, I would love to see motherlands become uh, an IP on the level of Star Wars and Star Trek as we flesh out those worlds and civilizations and those people, the adventures that you can have there and the things that you can discover there. The sky's the limit beyond the skies because they can go into the stars. Uh, I know you love powerful characters. Thank you. Uh, do you think people should start exploring diverse, powerful characters and the issues and problems they deal with? Um, yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, I definitely don't have time for this now to talk about my, my love of Superman. I will just say in broad strokes, Superman and Captain America serve the same narrative function uh, of the superlative of the person who does the right thing when doing the right thing is hard. Um, and it's very difficult for Superman to be Superman, but it is also difficult to tell a good Superman story because you have a morally implacable, physically indestructible character. Um, I wrote, uh, well, I don't have time to explain it to you. I was going to drop a link to a thing I wrote, but I can't give it the proper background. Uh, but, you know, exploring uh, the difficulties of, you know, godlike power and high morality is something I think is very valid. Um, what's my writing process for new campaigns? Oh, I do this quick. Do you have the end fixed and fill in a gap or do you improvise most of the stuff as your players give you good ideas? Uh, I very heavily plan the beginning. Uh, I roughly know where we need to be by the half and I roughly know where we need to be by the end, but I never plan the second half of the adventure. It there starts with a lot because the dice and the players will surprise and betray you. So very clear starting point, very nebulous end point and just sort of steer along the way. Dave, this talk has been amazing. Do you collaborate on board games as a cultural consultant? I'm a psychologist and board game designer from Argentina. My partner is Luis and I. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not even going to try and say your your name. I will ruin it. Yes, just hit me on hit me on Twitter at B Dave Walters. My DMs are open. Let me tell you this one thing because I know we're wrapping it up, and I said I had one last thing to say. Um, you all that are in this talk right now that have come to an event like this, you all are the solution to this problem. I appreciate that you all come here and soaked in all this information, but you probably were already thinking about these things in advance that this seemed appealing to you. Now you have to take this out into the world and spread it. The simplest thing is whenever you're in a room, whenever you're on a project and everyone looks the same, call that out. If you're in a room, if you're in a project and maybe one or two people are different. Make sure they get to talk. If you're in a room and you have a female colleague who's always getting talked over, intercede and say, hey, what were you trying to say? If somebody's getting run over, not getting listened to, not having their their thoughts and their wishes, you know, honored and listened to in a collaborative environment, nobody's going to get what they want all the time, but everybody needs to get to contribute. Remember, Fandom is about belonging in these projects and things are all made better and more profitable when different kinds of people get to contribute and con create something greater than the sum of its parts. Like I said, B. Dave Walters, DMs are open on Twitter at B. Dave Walters. Thank you all so very much for tuning in. Look at that precision and I'll see you next time.
Um, thank you, B. Dave. Uh, if you could see everybody, I mean, I think you can just see it in the chat. Everybody is, I don't know, you, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, please follow up with B. Dave um, for, for more conversation on Twitter. And uh, I'll make sure I give B. Dave the links to the Discord. So if he wants to pop in and check out the chat that was happening there also, uh, he'll be able to do that. So thank you again, B. Dave. We have an hour for lunch. Um, so get some food in your stomachs and we'll see you back again at I guess what is 4 p.m. Eastern time. See you soon. Thank you all.